lies one day at a time. Kimmy Kim and Elation's Radio. They're here to get your day going fine. Kimmy Kim and Elation's Radio. Kimmy Kim and Elation's Radio. Kimmy Kim and Elation's Radio. And here's your host. Miss Kim Robinson. Hello, my name is Glenda Johnson, better known as G. Johnson. When I'm not busy, I like tuning in to Elations Radio on Saturday nights with Apostle Irvin A. Whitlow, Jr., where the topic of discussion is making marriage meaningful. It appeals to the saved and the unsaved. It's for couples who are married, couples who are thinking about marriage, and for those who are divorced yet considering remarriage. Now, this discussion, making marriage meaningful, is the most explicit, authentic relationship Talk live here on Elations Radio. So save the date and time on your calendar. We look forward to hearing and seeing from you at 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time and 9 o'clock p.m. Central. So tune in to the broadcast and be blessed. Amen. Presence, 
Welcome to Making Marriage Meaningful. This is your host, Apostle Irvin Whitlow. And the Lord bless you and welcome to Making Marriage Meaningful. We are so honored and late and excited to be here. We missed you on last week, but we are back on this week. We are excited about what the Lord is going to say, what the Lord is going to do as we talk tonight about marriage and relationship. Now, please do understand, as I make this disclaimer, I am not a relationship expert, okay? I'm just going to put it out there. I just share with you the things that the Lord has shared with me, praying that it will help you. At the same time, I will make this other disclaimer that this conversation is real. It's raw, but it is relevant. So our aim is to help you as you are considering marriage, if you're already married, to help you in your marriage, if you've been divorced and thinking about remarriage, to help you in that thought process. Uh, and, of course, I don't do it by myself. i got some folk who do help me, and I just think I need to let you know who they be. You know, because they have experience with marriage just like me. Yeah, I think I'm going to start tonight with uh, my sister from another mister who makes sure that my hair is always straight. I'm talking about the one, the only, Sister G. Johnson up in Newark, New Jersey. Are you with me, my sister? Yes, 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 I am. Praise the Lord. Hope everyone is here tonight. We're ready for the broadcast. Amen. Well, she ready for the broadcast. That's what I'm talking about. That's a good thing. I want to skip all the way up to uh, to New Haven, New Haven, Connecticut, uh, to that, that wild man. That's what I call him, that wild man, the chief apostle uh, up there. Amen. Glory to God. Pastor Morningstar and, and the presider of uh, volume of the book. I'm talking about my other brother. That's Apostle Vincent L. Smith. I know you got to be there, my brother. Amen. Talk to me. If you don't know me by now, you will never, ever, ever know me. If you don't, I'm sorry. I, I I thought they said this was the oldest show. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm glad tonight to be on Making Marriage Meaningful, waiting to see where God will take us tonight. Mm. Ain't that something? I tell you, just leave it up to him to take us back in time. I promise. Oh, bless his name. Amen. I got another brother, you know, who's up there in the upper Marlboro, uh, Maryland area. He's the pastor of the uh, uh, of the Power to Stand Outreach Ministry, you know, and he's probably the most uh, comical brother I have, as far as I know. Sometimes he's you just gotta pray for him because you know sometimes he's special. But I thank God because sometimes he's a little yellow bus special, sometimes he's a little red bus special, and every now and again he's a little blue bus special. But he's still my brother. I'm talking about Overseer Elder Ernest E. Richard Jr. I know you're there, my brother. Oh, now you go give me the shower treatment. This is the day that the Lord has made. Oh, Let's did. rejoice. Amen. 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 That's Dr. Kimmy Kim, but I don't have my brother. Overseer Elder Ernest E. Richard. What? Now, something wrong with that picture. Amen. Uh, but well, he's not to the on Lord right Lord. now. I don't feel. Now, he's the one who told me he's going to meet me at 10 o'clock, and he's late. He's nine minutes late. That's my time. I'm taking it out of his pace. Amen. Glory to God. <laughs> but we're grateful to you. Thank God for you. Amen. I saw executive producer of this podcast, and she makes sure that everything works right. So thank you, Dr. Kimmy. Amen. We love you. We're praying for you. We pray that you're going to join the discussion tonight. Amen. Glory to God. Let me just double check. Let me see. Is uh, Pastor Belinda Wilkerson on from Huntsville, Alabama? All right. She's not here. 
All right, well, we say to God be the glory. Listen, we get ready to get this thing started. We got something to talk about that I believe is going to really uh, get your attention tonight. So, Apostle Smith, would you be so kind as to lead us in a word of prayer? Father, tonight we thank you as we have come to this point and this hour on this podcast that, Lord God, we seek you first. And we ask you tonight, God, to lead us and guide us that chains may be broken, ropes may be cut, lies may be turned around. Oh, God, you may mend somebody's heart, somebody's situation. And, God, you might tonight even, Lord, God, light a new fire in somebody's marriage. Lord, God, we thank you even now for the great things that you shall say and you shall cause us to get into tonight, we look, God, for a great result, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. 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 Our scripture text tonight comes from, as always, Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. Reading out an Amplified Bible, it says, Now the Lord God said it is not good, beneficial, For the man to be alone, I will make him a helper, one who balances him, a counterpart who is suitable and complementary for him. So the Lord God formed out of the ground every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. And the man gave name to all the livestock and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper that was suitable, a companion for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he fashion uh, formed into a woman and brought her and and presented her to the man. Then Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called old man because she was taken out of a man. For this reason shall shall man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed or embarrassed. Of course, we've been talking uh, for months now about matching God's meaning. We've been talking about that thoroughly, how God designed this marriage thing and how it often falls apart because people do not take time to follow God's plan for marriage. Marriage has really changed over the years. And then it used to be that marriage was between one man and one woman. Now it's between multiple people. Unfortunately, even in today's time, marriage is now between same-sex individuals. That's not what God intended. That's not what God wanted. God wanted one man with one woman. I know people may not want to hear that, but it's still the truth anyhow, and somebody has to be willing to to tell the truth. I do not agree with the law that uh, promotes and allows same-sex marriage. I need you to understand that I do not hate you for your choice of sexuality, but I do I am concerned that you are going to miss God because you have missed what God has ordained for your life. Now, in talking about marriage, we've come to the understanding that it has to match, your desire has to match God's design. That's the way it works. So we've come to the conclusion that, you know, it's not him looking for her, but it's them looking for each other. That has become an issue because so many people still believe these things that it is a man who finds a wife. When, in fact, the scripture says in Proverbs 18 and 22, whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtain favor of the Lord. But we've done what we've done is we made whoso into a man because of the word wife. What if that word wife is the wrong word? What if that word is supposed to be a companion? Who so findeth the companion? Because this is what God created. God didn't create a, a wife for Adam. He created a companion. 
That's what he did, someone who was suitable, someone who was compatible. So what if that word is supposed to be, whosoever findeth someone compatible obtains favor from the Lord and finds a good thing? What if that is the case? So therefore, he has to search for her, she has to search for him. Because if he finds her, right, and she doesn't do no searching, then she has to be stuck with what she's got. But if she's searching for him, then she has something to determine what's beneficial because she has to know what she wants, what she's desiring, what she's looking for. Because God is not one-sided. God is not prejudiced. God is not partial. So God is not going to give the man favor and let you get someone who's going to keep the going to give man a favor and let you experience someone who's going to cheat on you and manipulate you and mistreat you and then so that's not how God works. I don't care what nobody says. Y'all can go back with that old school stuff. I've been saying this and if you get mad at me, you just get mad at me. But I really believe a lot of things that we were taught were wrong. Why is that? Because a lot of the things that we taught was was wrong information. Why? Because our ancestors did not know what to learn back then. So today, we have to learn what to know. We need to educate ourselves on what's going to be beneficial. And if we learn what God says, if we learn what God wants, if we learn what God is meaning by his desire for us, it becomes easier to fulfill our life with men. So in all of that, we've come to this thing called a relationship chair. We have concluded that uh, that that commitment is foundational. If there's no commitment, there's no sense in building. There's no sense in getting involved because you don't, listen, you don't date somebody just to try somebody on for size and see if this one fits you and then to see if that one fits you. Because if you're going to do that, you might as well just kind of pick and go online and say, well, I'll, uh, I'll take this one this week. I'll go to that one next week. That's not what God intended. God intended you to find one individual that you can both together work on developing something that will be beneficial. It takes commitment. And with that com- commitment, there comes the legs of the chair, the first being friendship. We understand that there is a casual, there's the acquaintance, there's the casual friend, there's the close friend, and then there is the intimate friend. Please hear what I'm saying. That intimate friend, which a lot of people miss because they go from acquaintance to intimacy in a heartbeat, and then they wonder why things fall apart. There is a process into that. From friendship we go, amen, to fellowship. We understood fine. We understand in fellowship it takes commune. It takes to have you have to commune. You have to communicate. You have your community and your contribution, what you're sharing as y'all are becoming even closer because of the commitment to each other. Then we talked about family, developing the role of family, amen. And then we talked about finances and where finances play a role. We got the four legs out the way with the uh, with the foundation of commitment, and we've been on for the past month or two, we've been on faith in marriage. And while we've been talking about faith in marriage, we've been uh, coming to the conclusion, according to the word of Apostle Smith, that faith in marriage should be translated as confidence, the confidence to give what you are building into the hands of the Lord. And this is when we can say what God has joined together, let no man put asunder, because we took what we were building and said, that God, now we want you to seal it. This is what it's talking about. It ain't saying that God told you that this is the one and that that's the one. Because if you believe that, you're in trouble. Because God doesn't listen. God doesn't choose your mate for you. God made Adam's mate for him, but He allows you to choose your mate for yourself because God knows that you have a particular desire, a particular need to be met. You have a particular passion, and these are certain things you're looking for. You got a lot of people getting married; they don't have nothing in common. They don't have nothing that they can agree upon. They don't want to do nothing together. He's freaky and she's uh, a novice, and it causes them problems. He likes to go out and she likes to stay in. There's a problem. She wants kids. He don't want nothing. There's a problem. Better yet, she's barren. He's still. We got problems. So what I'm saying is we cannot say.
say that is what God has done if we haven't done our homework in our searching for that compatible person. Now, saying all that to say this, that hear what faith does. Faith supports the weight of the marriage because your marriage is going to go through something. Your relationship is going to go through something. And if you don't have faith in what you have built, I want you to know that it will collapse. So, therefore, faith supports the weight of your marriage. So, listen at me again. Faith supports the weight of your marriage. And so, because of that, we come to the conclusion that faith will handle the challenges in marriage. Please hear me. Faith will ha- handle the challenges. That means your differences of opinion. It will handle that. Faith will handle the comparisons in marriage because a lot of people spend a lot of time comparing their marriage to someone else's marriage. They compare what they've been through with what they dealt with with someone else, and these are some very, very serious issues. But tonight, here's what I want to do. I want to talk about uh, control in marriage. I want to talk about control in marriage, and control can be seen as manipulation, and anybody know anything about manipulation, it is a form of witchcraft, which means there is witchcraft in marriage. Okay, I don't want to hear that part, but there is witchcraft in marriage because of control. Now, here, I want to break down control for you so that you will have a much better, more clarified understanding so you don't think that I'm just talking words, but you will know that I know exactly what I'm talking about and what the Lord is actually saying on this wise. So now, please hear me, okay? When we talk about control in marriage, well, before we even get to these things, I just want to hear your thought, uh, G. Johnson, about what does that mean to you, control in marriage? What does that mean to you? Uh, okay. Uh, control, when, when that, that word control itself, um, it, it sort of, yeah, it goes hand in hand almost as manipulation. It means that someone is trying to control um, the marriage and, and rather than letting the marriage work by faith, is you know control. I want it. This, it has to be this way, that way. So it's like um, it's all uh, it's all playing out. So to me, it's it's like a machine, you know. But um, but that to me, control is like uh, it's one sided. You know, you you have to do it my way or the highway. Amen. Okay. Come on, um, let me hear what you have to say on that, uh, Kimmy. Dr. Kimmy, what do you think about that? Where you at, Kimmy? She done left me. Oh, Jesus. All right, come on, Apostle Smith. Talk to me about that control in marriage. What does that mean to you? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I was talking and muted. <laughs> Oh, okay. Come on, talk to me. What does that mean to you, control in marriage? Well, I was in one. And when you have a partner who is controlling, that is a sign of their insecurities. But at the time, I didn't know it because, you know, I was the one trying to make it work. So when you have a partner who's controlling, there are warning signs in the beginning while you're dating, but sometimes we tend to overlook that. And that's not a sign of love. That is not from God because one thing about marriage is the unity. It's unified. It's a trust. You you trust that person mm-hmm. based on, you know, uh, the relationship that you guys have, um, you know, uh, developed. And when you are married to someone who is controlling, that is not from God. Mm-hmm. And you have to pray on it because uh, I really believe that um, – when it's from God, that marriage won't uh, dissolve or it won't be destroyed. But there are times when we tend to put ourselves with others that God did not ordain. And so Amen. sometimes we may have these issues like controlling insecurities and, you know, dominance. And so with that being said, I will give it to the Lord and uh, allow him to work it out. But, um, to make a long story short, I did have to do the divorce because I realized that um, he will forgive me, even though he hates divorce. But um, controlling, 
factors been dominant in a relationship, it won't work unless uh, both parties are willing to to go through counseling. Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Apostle, Apostle Smith, come on, talk to me. What do you think about this control in marriage? I I I think I know everybody don't think I'm crazy for a minute, but give me a give me a chance to finish my statement. First of, all, first of all, when I hear the word control, mm-hmm. without that, without definition, I think about there is negative and positive control. Mm-hmm. We most times dwell on negative control, but there is negative and positive control. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. I ain't never seen nobody go over to the wall and take a hammer and smash their thermometer. But that's that's a means of control. You control your level of temperature. You also control your amount of usage of gas or electric. So that is both negative and positive control. Now, someone who is human trying to control another, that's never going to work. And even in that light, if you have a person uh, that see where they need to come in and sort of control where you're out of sort, that's a good control. Give me, understand me good now. Come in to help you, not to demand of you, not to put their foot up your boss de Leon, but to to help you and guide you, they're going to control the situation. No, you spend too much money. Let me let me take you on, on, on a on a visual. Or let me take you and school you a little bit, and then I'm going to release you a bit. So when we use this word control tonight. Let's, let's not stay just in the negative. We're going to have to show the contrast. What is that that is negative? What is that that is positive? And how to balance the difference? Hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, Overseer Richard, I believe you're with us now. Uh Talk to us about what you think about control in marriage. Well, and first of all, I apologize for my lateness. I was kind of trying to get a jump on tomorrow morning's message, but I guess we'll be all right. Anyway, control. I like what you said, Apostle Mm -hmm. Smith. Uh, I'm looking at both sides of the fence. There is good control. There is not so good control. There's positive and there's negative, as it was already stated. In the positive, I want to keep you from damaging yourself, hurting yourself, and hurting other people. But in the negative, I want to keep you from reaching out to other people because I want you to myself. That And uh, Sister Kimmy Kim, my heart goes out to you because uh, I believe when we met, well, we won't go too far in that conversation, but when we met, I think you were telling me some stuff about that way back in the day, some few years ago. I was in a different type of control type uh, marriage myself, but it wasn't control to the point where they were trying to dominate. It was control to the point that the individual tried to make me think I was crazy, like something was wrong with me. Like, you know, if I say the sky is blue, they would turn around and show me every reason why the sky was grayish and not blue. You know, that type of thing. Here's my thought on control. Uh, Except for slavery, anything negative 
ought to be destroyed when you're talking about control. Anything positive ought to be enhanced. So when I'm thinking about control in marriage, that was not the plan that God had for marriage. That was not what God ordained for marriage. That is what not not what God put in uh, in place for the marriage to be. It should have been mutual submission. And for those men who feel like they've got to dominate their wife, they've got to tell her what to do because in your eyesight you think she's stupid, my brother. She's not as dumb as you think, okay? She's trying to be submissive, but keep pressing the wrong buttons, and you're going to find out a few things. I know you saw, uh, uh, I think it was Medea's family reunion, when my girl was supposed to be getting married. My man ended up with the frying pan upside his head and the hot grits. You know the story. Control, that type of thing. Blair Underwood played the boyfriend, the fiance. I can't think of which one it was, but y'all know what I'm talking about. Well, well, let me let me let me say this because I've listened to every one of you, and I, 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 when I think of control, I always think of a dominating factor. Now, mm-hmm. I believe this because a lot of people have misinterpreted this. We talked about mm-hmm. this several months ago when we talked about how the Bible says that the wife is to be in submission to her husband. Right, but now being in submission or being in subjection does not relate to being in control or being a dominating factor. That becomes an issue in marriage because many people, when we hear control, automatically we think dominating. And let's be truthful. Most cases, The domination is not in a good sense. Let me give you a typical example. If we need to negotiate and you're refusing to negotiate, that's because you're choosing to dominate. That is control. There is no good in that. Now, Apostle Smith, I think that there is a difference between having a balance as opposed to someone controlling. Because anytime there's control, something is wrong. Anytime there's control, there's something wrong. I think that we ought to have balance in marriage. We ought to know what is good, what is beneficial, what is healthy, because together we're trying to accomplish something. But anyone trying to overpower or overdo is someone seeking to be in control. For instance, Okay, if I say that this this is what we need to do concerning this particular uh, issue in the home, but the spouse says, well, no, I don't want to do that because I don't like that idea, and I think we need to do this, and if we don't do this, then so and so and so with ultimatum, that is, again, control. There is nothing good about it. So then, then there comes a time when, in a sense, that I can think about you saying, you know, well, maybe there's some people we need not to be involved with. And if it's a mutual agreement, then it's not control. But if you're demanding then that is control. That's not a good thing. So we have to have a good understanding of control. We have to have a clear understanding. There's a difference between submission and domination. A difference Mm -hmm. between submission and domination. And in many cases, there are men trying to dominate the women, and there are women trying to dominate the men. And then they have this thing that they want to use called leverage. That becomes a problem for the marriage and for the relationship. That's why you have some people who are abusive. You have some men who beat their women because what? They want to dominate. That is not a beneficial thing circumstances. Then you have those women who want to do the, they want to do something on the opposite scale that becomes dominating. That is not a good thing. So there is a difference between submission and domination. Any comments on that? Brother Hose? Brother Hose? Uh, yes, sir? You, 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 before 
before you go much further, I didn't want to lose this point. That's why I preference my words the way I did. And then you came back and you hit it right on the head. I thought somebody else would bring it out, but you hit it right on the head. And that's why I prefaced my words the way I did. Control only happens when you lose balance. Okay. When you lose balance, when it, when that thing starts tilting over to one side, where the man got to have everything to say, or it starts tilting over to the other side, where the woman got to have all to say so, you have lost balance. Mm. And it becomes manipulation because the person understands you have lost your place. Now, they're going to take advantage of it because in the midst of you losing your place, Everything they say now, you're still saying, yeah, honey, yeah, baby, yeah. And they know that they work in this thing for their own tilted side. And they got oh. this enough to say, we need to sit down and balance this back out. No, I'm going to run this show. Oh. And that's the sad thing mm. about it. There ain't no show to run. Mm. Okay. Amen. Sister G. Johnson, you want to say anything on that? Uh, I agree. There, there's no show to run. Is you know basically trying to come to the middle. Except you know when it balances out, you need to come you know to the to the middle. And if if you find that you can't do that, then that's a problem. Okay. Overseer uh, Richard, I noticed something, yes. and we've talked about it. Over and over, we talked about it. So please, let's help people to understand what it means for that husband, that man, to be the prophet, the priest, and the king, so people do not think that he is trying to dominate. Please help us with that. Well, when you talk about the prophet, the priest, and the king, you are talking about a servant leader. Somebody who sets the example, somebody who steps up to the plate and uh, becomes the mediator or the surrogate, if I could use that word, for that particular family. A real prophet, a real priest, and a real king, uh, and when I say real, I mean those who are actually those husbands who are literally stepping up to the plate. Um the real prophet sees and can foretell what's going on. He's paying attention to his wife. He's paying attention to his children. He's paying attention to the situation, the circumstances. And though he may not know everything, his instincts would usually guide him when it comes to making judgments about the family, usually in a positive way. When you talk about the priest, you're talking about one who's leading his family in worship, one who's setting the example for his family in worship, one who is uh, bringing his family into the presence of Almighty God. Now, lastly, when you're talking about a king, you're not talking about a dominant ruler. You're talking about someone who is presiding over something but at the same time has a soft enough heart to where he can hear what his subjects, in this case his family, might have to say. Because, you know, most of us men, let's just be honest, I hate to say it this way, but I got to say it, sometimes we think we write all the time. And half the time we half write, and half write means you're still going wrong. Hey, so that's basically <laughs> I know, but nobody I asked you, that. Sister G. John. Nobody asked you, Sister G. Johnson. Anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, but that 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 that's pretty much it, you know. And it's always that thing I talk about when we talk about the the headship of a man being the visionary. He could see the big picture, but when it comes down to the details of that picture, yeah, that's where the spouse comes in at. And when we get this in our head that it's a co-reigning. Uh, then I think we'll be all right. When we say, I'm the, you know, I wear the pants in this family, let me throw something at you. And those of you listening 
uh, by way of radio, and those of you who may be watching by uh, social media, however you're doing this, I want to say that, yeah, your man, your husband is wearing, husbands, you are wearing the pants in the family, but uh, when it comes down to those other areas of life, I think your wife is controlling the zipper. So if I were you, I'd just get in my place, fill my space, and stop trying to be more than you're supposed to be. Okay, that's all I'm going to say on that. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Now, now, this is something This is something that I want to say. Here, here, notice what Adam says. He said, this is not bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. In essence, what he does is he validates her equality. We have a problem when we when 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 we try to make women look like they are a weaker uh, uh, part of the marital mm-hmm. relationship, and just as much right as he does. The only difference is that. His uh, his assignment is to love her. Her assignment is to submit to him. It's just that simple. Mm-hmm. It's just that simple. And I think that if we understand responsibilities, if we understand roles, if we understand what we're supposed to do, I think it would lead away from this domination so that we can have a better flow of what God really desires. So we find that marriages don't last. And one of the biggest reasons they don't last is because people are sick and tired of being controlled by him or by her. Nobody wants it. Nobody wants to be bothered with it. And to be honest with it, to be honest about it, you can't say it is of God because God did not make uh, a woman to rule over a man. He made the man to be the head. I didn't say the rule, but to be the head (laughs) of that woman, not the house, but woman. And when he leads that woman in the right direction, then that house can flow in the right direction. So when we talk about control in marriage, there are certain signs that we need to pay attention to. One of the first things that we need to pay attention to is the mate who is always trying to isolate you. Isolation Mm -hmm. is the very thing. Now, Grant, the The Bible does say that, therefore, for this reason shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife. But it didn't say that he couldn't have a relationship with them. It didn't say that he couldn't see about them or he couldn't see about some of his constituents. And so there's a problem when that man is telling that woman, no, you can't go see this one. You can't go see, you can't hang out with this one. You can't hang out with that one or vice versa. I don't want you around him. I don't want you around her. Point blank period. Isolation is a problem. Who's going to talk to me on that? Well, Mm -hmm. let me jump in there before everybody gets started because you said something there that we have to clarify. Now, if it's somebody that's a bad influence, uh, it would be the husband's right to say to the wife, uh, that's not a good idea to go hang out with Susie and them. I mean, first of all, you are married. Susie is not. You have a husband. Susie does not. You have children. Susie does not. You dress moderate. Susie looks like your typical street slut. No disrespect, but I'm just saying it like it is. You know, I mean, in that respect, yeah, you're 100% right. But on the other side of the coin, you know, they don't want you to hang up with Susie because she's, and this is the man's mindset, she's a goody two-shoes, she's a churchgoer, a holy roller, she'll have you jumping pews and you'll be acting all kinds of weird and crazy, something that might be good for you and possibly good on you, meaning uh, being around that person it kind of takes away any power that he might have because now you're learning mm. of a better influence in in Jesus Christ. And this mm. controlling husband recognizes that if you keep hanging out with that person, you're going to wake up and realize that you are not mm-hmm. to be dominated, which is really what he's doing. He's dominating. Mm-hmm. He's trying to dominate your life, trying to dictate where you can go, what you can do, what you can wear, what you cannot wear, who you should speak to. And, I mean, it is a sad thing. Again, i got to go back to uh, a movie set, uh, and I 
think it was that. Uh, remember the movie Diary of a Mad Black Woman? Mm-hmm. Everybody remember that movie? You remember mm-hmm. how it started yeah. out? Uh, this uh, the husband is making this great speech, and he came across like he was so in love with his wife, and he put on this spectacular show. All of a sudden, they get back to the house, and he just says, "Excuse my French, you tells her, get the hell out my car." You know. In other words, he basically spits in her face. That right there is a telltale sign. I don't know if that happened in the boyfriend-girlfriend aspects, but when you get to that point in a relationship, especially in marriage, that's the telltale mm-hmm. sign. It's time to go because, you know, I mean, right. you got to go because if you don't go, somebody's going to go one way or another. So I'm going right. to stop right there because I know somebody else got something else to add. Let me just say this real quick. Uh, overseer, what happened yes, in that was not that's not domination, that's straight abuse. It's <laughs> and domination abuse, and abuse, what are they? Uh, abuse, abuse is probably worse than control. In mm. my book, uh, it's probably worse than control. G. Johnson, you want to say something? Come on, talk to me. No, I was just thinking about what he was saying about it. He said, get out of my car. And yeah, when it gets to that point where you talking, where you talking slick like that, uh, to me, uh, yeah, it's it's time to, you know, some things got to happen. Yeah, because it, it's it's pretty much over when uh, uh one of the mates are talking like that, you know, they're they're pretty much done. And and when he was talking like about that, soon after that, after really shortly, stuff started to you know, uh, deteriorate in that marriage. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, okay. and I know if I can uh-huh. say this, uh, Apostle, you say that uh, abuse and domi- abuse and domination are cousins. They're kissing cousins. Mm-hmm. That's how close mm-hmm. they are. There is no mm-hmm. difference. One okay. is just yeah. a bit more subtle than the other. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no real mm-hmm. difference. The, 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 the variation from one is abuse, you're outright and you're blatant. But when you're uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, talking about uh, 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 somebody dominating, you try to put on a show. Behind closed doors, you're one way, and in the open, you're something altogether different. Mm-hmm. That's all. Mm-hmm. Apostle Smith, come on, talk to us. Well, in, in listening, in listening at our uh, discourse and, and conversation tonight, uh, one thing keeps coming to me is that really, according to Scripture, the only thing you're supposed to be trying to take control over is yourself. Okay. When they talk about control, we go to Galatians 6. It said, have self-control. Uh-huh. And this is about anyone trying to control another really is a punk in operation. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. You can't okay. get you under control, so you got to control something. So you take it out on your wife. You mm-hmm. take it out on your okay. children. Wow. You take, you take it out on those who may be workers under your supervision on your job. But really, mm-hmm. you're a mm-hmm. punk because you don't know how to handle you. Uh-huh. So now you're trying to handle others because it makes you feel mm-hmm. me. So the truth of the uh-huh. matter is, Unless you have control for you, you're always going to be trying to manipulate something else because the real deal is you're scared of getting yourself together. Mm-hmm. Well, then, so then there would be those who would argue this with you, that if I'm supposed to be in control of me, and she and I are one, then I have the right to control her too. No, sir. Control says this. When you have self-control, it means I temperament myself to the place where I know how to interact, put on an act. 
All right, I now. Know, I know how to yeah. interact and treat this person with respect. I don't know how many of y'all have ever gone through it, but it ain't too pleasurable. Working on any job, corporate, factory, or whatever it is, it's not that great of a day working for a supervisor that likes to yell at you instead of asking or talking to you as though they have been. Amen. There is, there is some there is some disconnect in that person. They can't control themselves. So now they want to come and pour that out on everybody around mm-hmm. them. Feel like I'm the big chief, mm-hmm. and you are too. You're the big stinking chief. Because nobody uh, wants to be around, and I'm going to use this word, because nobody want to be around a bully. Nobody. Amen. Well, I, I just got a message. I just got a message from the one and the only Bishop Jefferson. He says, I'm in charge, period, dot com. <laughs> oh, that's a shame. Oh, yeah, I've heard that. Lord help, but, uh, Lord help the bishop. Right, but listen, but listen, this this thing called, <laughs> but this thing called isolation is just and 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 overseer. I heard you say something that makes sense, but then again, it leads to a place of control, because if you're telling me that you don't want me around this individual because this individual's attitude is wrong. This individual is not in the same category as I am, or so on and so forth. What it tells me is that you're trying, you're very opinionated, and you're trying to dictate to me who I can be around and who I cannot be around. So in my mind, that becomes control. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yes. Come on. Well, so is that not? But when a person is in, when a person is opinionated, then they're trying to be in control. Mm-hmm. Would you not agree? I definitely agree. When they when a person wants to be uh, uh, in control of uh, uh, of another individual, they're going to do what they're going. They're manip- Let's just say this: they are manipulative. All right, exceptionally manipulative. And, you know, I mean, what are you going to say to that? Really? Really, what are you going to say to that? Help me. Somebody, just just, just, just fill me in there. What, what can you say when somebody wants to manipulate you, wants to dominate you, wants to put you in a position whereby, uh, 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 you know, you, you find yourself in a position where, oh, my God, help me get the right words, Holy Spirit. I need the right words. When somebody's in that particular condition or in that situation, they want to make you think that what they're telling you is absolute truth when in reality it is their truth and not really mm-hmm. the perception of what be, what really is true. I think that's how I'm trying to say it. Okay. I think that's how I'm trying to say it. You know, mm-hmm. because, I mean, at the end so- of the day, why are you trying to control the mindset of that individual? Why are you trying to uh, make make your, in this case, your spouse feel like she's less than what she is? Why are you doing it? Help me. Mm-hmm. Why are you trying well, to make her feel like she's she, she she's worthless, useless? Well, well, consider mm-hmm. consider well, one uh, one person stated. Then consider another person suffers. Someone said earlier uh, that some someone I think it was uh, Dr. Kimmy who said someone is suffering from insecurity. So these mm. things uh-huh. exist. It uh-huh. triggers their mind to, in a certain way, which again leads to control. That's what it does. Mm. So 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 okay. check it out. So check it out. You know, it'd be different if, you know, we as brothers, 
and you say to me, bro, I don't think you should, and Sister G, don't have a fit with me. Please don't. Okay, but bro, it would be something if you said to me, hey, bro, you know, I'm looking out for you, and I know Sister G. Johnson, and I know she's a, 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 I know what kind of woman she is, and she's not a good idea for you, so you don't need to talk to her in the sense of creating a relationship. Okay, mm-hmm. so I can understand that as a brother standing up, but now vice versa. Now, if I'm married to G. Johnson, right, and she says, you know what, there's something about your brother that I just don't like. And, uh, you know, mm-hmm. and I don't think that y'all should be as tight as y'all are. Then, All right. isn't there, don't, you, don't you see the irony here? Because I do. Because now she's my wife. And she sees something wrong, right? but, but she's not making a demand. She just sends, she's just sending her suggestion. See, so your mm-hmm. suggestion is not controlled. It's mm, when true. your suggestion to overtake my mindset because this is what this is what the Bible says um, in in second Corinthians 10 uh, 4 I believe in 5 it says um, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and casting down in high imagination and everything that brought yourself so so when you're trying to dominate that mind what you're doing is you're you're saying that your belief system is right your thought is right and your attitude is right, so therefore you have the right to try to force your thoughts into mine so that I will abide by your thoughts. That is domination. That is that control. Is. That's All right. Can I ask the question? Yes, sir. If what you say is right, Oh, Lord, I always got to get in trouble. If what you said is just right, then that means there's a lot of control going on from the pulpit. There is. Well. There is. Well, haven't you read the book, Witchcraft uh, Witchcraft in the Pews? It it goes in the pulpit, too. Wow. It's with more than that. But here's what is being used. To, here's what is being used in witchcraft in the church from the from the pulpit. It is because called intellectualism. Because intellectualism is creating mind bondage. Oh boy. Mm. Mm. It's because of us, we 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 have a lot of leaders. In this day and hour, and I've even seen it in the past, but we got a lot of leaders in this hour saying it's my way or the highway. You do what I say. Well, I mm-hmm. thought I was going to be doing what Jesus said. Mm-hmm. And he left you here to teach me his way so I can go his way. All right, now. Now, now. Apostle, now this is what the Word of God says based upon what you just said. The Word of God says in 1 Corinthians, uh, the 11th chapter and the 3rd verse, I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So God is always about order. But in his order, what he does is he shows us what he would like from us. Hear what I'm saying? He does not go. One thing about the Lord is the Bible says that he sends his spirit to lead us and to guide us into all truth. Why? Because there are things that we should be able to operate in. And so if we make this clear in the marital relationship, then a lot of these things won't be an issue. So if we have the same belief system, it's not a challenge. If we are, if we are walking in the same faith, we are not having a challenge, right? If we are flowing with the order of God, there's, these things won't be a challenge. But when you have people who are outside trying to do what they want to do or go above and beyond what God has said, then we have problems. Wait a minute. Now, let Come me on. read you this comment. Let me read you this 
comment. Bishop Jefferson says, most women have no problem being in submission when the man is in order with God. That's when they will follow. Control is not and the, uh, a man, control is not a man who won't listen when they know that they're not in proper place with God and that woman in their life. So it's all about being in order with God. It's all about being in order with God. Can I offer one? Can I offer one more pity? So you're telling me, you're you're telling me, according to what you just read and what you just explained, then you're telling me, right in the pulpit, we have those who are even trying to pull God's woman. To themselves. Uh-oh. Did you not hear what I'm saying? I, 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 no, I want you to tell me plainly that you're saying tonight that even in the pulpit, we got those mm-hmm. who are trying to control and pull God's woman because the church is God's woman. That's right. That. So we got those in the pulpit that's trying to manipulate God's woman and pull God's woman to themselves. Absolutely. Mm. Well, wait, they must, wait, be, wait. Them. They yeah. must be on drugs. They pass drugs. They are <laughs> multi quaaludes. No, what they own, yeah. I think what they own, they own some <laughs> devilish stuff. Wait a minute, okay. let me get this straight. So, so, huh? Okay, so, when he says, what, what do you mean? Break it down to me. What are you asking? Okay, so. you saying, she's saying break in the, down. from the pulpit. Well, I asked a question about control from the pulpit. And then Apostle okay. brought up the scripture about God is the head of man, man is the head of a woman, and all that. And then he explained that how that works and all that. So then according to my question and his answer, then evidently we have preachers who are using manipulation they're using this control thing against God's woman because God is coming back to marry the church. Uh-huh. And they're trying to play games with God's woman and manipulating mm-hmm. God's woman to get that mm-hmm. thing across, not his. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right. All right. Thank you. Now, now. Let me show you how isolation works there. You have pastors who will tell God's woman, you cannot go fellowship over here. Oh, and you better oh, not God. go fellowship over there. Especially when we got something else going on. That's not, that's control right there. Uh-huh. Oh, boy. <laughs> All right, well, you know, and I'm Talk not, I, I'm sitting back, I, I'm just sitting back listening uh, because, I mean, you know, at the essence of when you talk about that C-O-N-T-R-O-L, you're looking at somebody who's uh, constantly ongoing and trying to navigate their way to trick somebody into believing that something is, trying to uh, persuade somebody that something must be in order for the relationship or whatever it is they're trying to do the work. If you're talking about control, you're talking about an individual who wants to live another individual's life, not vicariously through that individual, but live that individual's life. And they, as far as they're concerned, you can do nothing right except you consult with them. And that's a manipulation Mm. of the mind. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. That is a straight-up manipulation of the mind. There are many women, and this is very sad to say, 
there are women today who feel like their husband or their boyfriend does not love them unless he beats on them. And that's another form of control. When you mm-hmm. take some, when you are, when you physically abuse somebody into submission, that's mm. not what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to take dominion. We're supposed to have dominion and not dominate. You ain't gonna find nowhere in the scripture where God says go out and dominate. He said had dominion. You go back into Genesis, and if you find the word dominate in there, meaning you go in, you take control, and whatever it is you're dominating does exactly what you said. It says have dominion. The difference between dominion and dominate is dominion comes with a power and authority that is not controlling in a sense, but has enough authority to control. Dominate means you're forcing somebody to do something that they don't want to do. Easy as pie. Mm-hmm. Uh-oh. I got a, I've got a question. I got a question. Go, go for it. Go for it. Are, are women out of order pastoring if the man is the head? No. Not my question. <laughs> no, no, because no, see, no, they are see, not. Go you, ahead, when Bob. You get, when you get into the spiritual arena, all there right, is hey. not, uh-huh. there's no male. There's no male right. or female. It's the right. person that God okay. want to use. Now, I want to say okay. this. I do believe even if that woman is called <laughs> into pastorate, there ought to be a certain respect for her husband come to decisions and things. You don't throw him to the side and say, I'm the pastor. You go mm-hmm. somewhere and sit down. One of the blessings as a pastor here in our city right now, 97 years old, and preach harder than any of us on this line. But the success of her ministry for years was that whenever it came time to make a decision, she never left her husband out. And she would Mm. tell anybody, I bring my husband into decisions for the church because he is my head. Mm. Amen. She okay. said, I pass the church. Okay. She said, I pass the church. But when it comes to business decisions for this church, I bring my husband in because he's the head. And she said, I can't Amen. throw him to the side. Amen. Just because the Lord right. called me the pastor. She said the Lord wants me to involve him. That's how me as pastor and him as husband is going to flow together. And this ministry is going to be safe because I keep recognizing yeah. him as my head. Well, then, well, then Apostle Smith, I have a question then based upon what you said. You said your words were in the realm of the spirit, there is no gender. This is what you said. So then, I tell said, me. I said, to be a pastor. I said, to be a pastor. Yeah. There is no gender. But in respect, okay. in respect of marriage, in respect of marriage, you should include your mate. Okay. So, so, so Bishop says, so the woman is the head at the church. And the husband is ahead at home. Is that right? Well, I'm gonna say it like this: mm-hmm. Jesus is the head at church. We are the under shepherds that He chooses to work His work amongst the people of God. Really, we are not the head. We are not mm-hmm. the head. Okay. When it comes to pastors, right. we have been chosen and called by okay. God. Amen. Mm-hmm. To, so to, now, to my the under we, we are really pastors in the earth are really taking direction from heaven and then giving it out to the people. And this is where we miss okay. it. You are not in charge of God's people. You are a mouthpiece 
in God's house to give them God's direction. Um, and that, I that's God, for, that's Jeremiah three fifteen. He said, "I will give you power." Not Jeremiah. He said, yeah, "I yeah. will give you power." After, he didn't say male nor female. He said, "I'll give not. you power after well, my own heart." Now y'all better get off this subject because I'll keep you on the line all night. Well, no, we can't get off of it because there are some who are listening to need further instruction. If you look at Galatians chapter 3, I'm going to read from verse 26 all the way to 29 so that they get the understanding of what's being said and what you just uh, reiterated, Apostle Smith. It simply says, and we're talking about sons through faith in Christ right here. It says, if you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor mm-hmm. free, male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Keep in mind, for the Gentile nation, they were grafted in. The Jewish nation was birthed, and the Gentile nation was grafted in. And Paul is just letting the Galatians know right there, as well as letting us know that in Christ, there is no male nor female when it comes down to it. Yes, the woman is the angel of that house. Now, we ain't going to get into that discussion because like Apostle Smith said, we can go, how far back do you want to go? I mean, we can go back to Esther, we can go back to Deborah, we can talk about all them. We can start talking about Mary Magdalene who sat there at the grave. And got instructions, the first one to receive a word from the Lord, and then go deliver that word to Peter and the apostles who were camping out somewhere. I, I don't know if it was the upper room or Rhoda's house or wherever they were. They were somewhere, but Mary brought the word to them. So basically, if you really want to get down to business, if you're going to do the male-female thing, the first sermon ever preached was not at Pentecost. It was literally from the grave. She got the word hot off the press. Go tell my disciples and Peter. Well, okay. so then, so wait a minute, then. So, because you just read this, so this is going to raise a big question. So, since in Christ there is neither male or female, then why are so many people bothered by a woman bishop? Because there is no uh-huh. male or female. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you why. Go I'm ahead. I'm going to tell you why. And ain't nobody going to like me tonight. Because we, got too many, cause we got too many. Listen at me carefully. We got too many damned ignorant folk in the pulpit. <laughs> and I didn't say <laughs> damn. I said damn. <laughs> I said we got two many of them in the book. What what we have done, what we have done in the church, in scriptures where it says he and and him, and uh, we have tried to make the church a masculine place. Mm-hmm. And you know why that we're is really, possible. Okay. When really, if you search the scriptures, the mm-hmm. church is a feminine place. Because it uh-huh. as a woman, a dog, the bride of Christ. For, y'all ain't going to talk to me now. Come I, on, I, come I, on. I want you to understand tonight, when it comes to the issue of a woman bishop, they try to harp on that one little piece of verse, the mm. husband of one wife. Mm-hmm. If you could go and do some word search and some deeper study than what the Catholic Church says about being a bishop, you will find out that Lydia was not just a dressmaker. She wore purple because she was a bishop making robes. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Mm-hmm. Somebody, you just messed okay. somebody up, man. I told you do y'all that? that I told y'all let this baby sleep tonight. Because we can get, we can get so deep in this thing, we're going to lose 
we're going to lose our point of reference tonight. Control. Mm. Well, but, and that's another area in the church where there's been control to keep women down. Mm. Well, so then, also, if we don't deal with these things, how will we ever bring the church to a place of deliverance where God can really show himself mighty and strong, especially seeing yeah. now that our local assembly have been closed and we're doing services through internet and social media and through uh, conference calls and things like that. So maybe this is the opportunity that the Lord is saying, hey, this is thing, this has been a wound that we need to dive into, clean it out so we can mend it. Can, can I can I give a good and simple analogy without without really uh, a long time? Let's say for instance Come on. Me, you, and and Rich, and I'll even throw Jefferson in here because he done threw this time bomb out here. <laughs> All of us raised by a woman pastor. Uh huh. Mm. We done got saved under that ministry, filled with the Holy mm. Ghost, we done taught us the ways of holiness. We done become strong men of God mm-hmm. under mm. under her tutelage. Mm. Then. We get called into ministry. We start preaching. We're made elders. Now the Lord is calling us into pastoring. You mean to tell me when I get called out to pastor, I am not to connect myself with this person that done help me in every arena of my walk with God. I done been trained by this person. But when I go out to pastor and want to stay connected with them as my bishop, overseer, mama, whatever you want to call it, I mm. can't do that. I now got to find a man because she's a woman, but she doesn't help me through all them stages. Well, mm. I'm, I'm going to respond to that, Apostle Whitlow. And both of you, as a matter of fact, all of you should know now who my mama is, who my mama was. And my mama was one of the most powerful women in the city of New Haven, okay? Yeah. And I mean, at one time, she she was controversially challenged in the Unified Free Will Baptist Church at one point. And to me, that was God's way of launching her out into the deep and pushing her out to where she needed to be. Because she he knew she had to get pregnant and give birth to a bubbly, bouncing baby boy by the name of Ernest. So if that's the case, then I guess, uh, you know, I, I'm turning in my overseer's license, you know, I'm turning in my elder's license, I'm turning in my deacon's license. Uh, any more license I need to turn in, anybody just talk to me. Cause I'm just wondering, because if what, you, if what people are saying is true, then everything that I've done up to this present point in time was just a farce and was just a show, a dog and pony show, because none of it's real, neither is it legitimate. That's all I'm going to say on that. Let, let, let me say one more um, thing. Uh, 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 <laughs> college of bishops. As a matter of fact, I was just thinking about this the other day, how ignorant this thing has been. At the College of Bishops, they put one of the bishops on to preach. Did a wonderful teaching. Then at the end of his message, he said, oh, yes, and let me say something to all the sisters who are here calling yourself bishops now. When he said it like that, I leaned over to the bishop next to me. I said, this statement is getting ready to be just his office off. Mm-hmm. He said, you might be bishops, but you need to get yourself a husband because you need to be under a man. Mm-hmm. And when he sat down, yeah. like he had said something wonderful. <laughs> well, Okay. And so, and the Boston guy, it, I mean, it left the it left the it left the room in such a shock. Quiet, quiet. It was mm. silent. It was silent across the entire room. Mm. And, and, and all of y'all that know Bishop Ellis, please keep him in prayer. But all of y'all that know Bishop Ellis, he ain't never lost words. When he got up to the mm. microphone. 
He says, uh, um, um, he didn't even know which way to go when the man left the room like that. Some of this stuff that we have been fighting about for years, and yes, I did say we, but I've never been on uh, the, the, the downside because I know too many women who've been in ministry and their story, including my mother. Even at one of our family reunions, we were using the church. It wasn't a service. We were using the some of the deacons who were our family member refused to let her preach from the pulpit. Then they oh, got goodness. so bad they didn't want her to pre- preach from the floor. Mm. Oh, where the conviction was coming. They didn't want to hear that. My my uncle my uncle had to ask my father would he share the message that day. And my father at wow. first said no. He said, My wife is on the preach. She's able to do. Then my uncle had to explain to him what was going on. He said, Well, mm. I tell you what. He said, I'll sit in the pulpit. Then my uncle said, I tell you what. He said, you sit in the pulpit, but I'm going to call her for remarks. Lord have was, mercy. My uncle was a trickster, see. Uh-huh. He said, I'll call her for remarks. And the choir had just got finished singing a good hot song. And they had the nerve to call my mother for remarks. My mother preached all she could and some more. And them same deacons that said she couldn't preach because they called it remarks. They were up on their seats about, yeah, yeah. Ignorance. Ignorance is dangerous. Only to the one that don't know it. Yeah, ignorance is dangerous. Yeah, you can. Doubt about that. And that whole conversation. On that thing, I don't care where I go. And the, re- the reason I sound like this apostle, I'm not upset with you, neither Bishop Jefferson. But I have faced this conversation now for some 22 years. Hmm. And some organizations hmm. haven't gotten any better about this conversation than when it first started. And y'all want to know the truth? The first Pentecostal church had a woman bishop, and the name of that organization was Mount Sinai. Go look it up. All right. I hear you. But but could it be that this control emerges from the ignorance? Uh Uh-huh. That could so emerge from where? The ignorance. From ignorance. Mm. Oh, okay, so you you sort of cutting out a little mm. bit because meaning that people just don't know no better, right? Because cause, listen, in my estimation, in in my estimation, a lot of the things that we see is based upon some of the poor examples that we had. Mm. And so many have operated from those things. And I said it earlier, in the day, many of our ancestors ancestors did not know what to learn. So today we have to learn what to know in order to be thorough and effective and have a healthy marriage, healthy relationship, point blank period, to even operate a healthy business. We have to know, we have to learn what to know, which means, like you said, we've got to do research. We've got to study. We've got to look. We've got to uh, 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 make it our business to find out all that we need to find out. Amen? Amen. 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 Oh, now, now, it's controlled. Now, now, Apostle, huh? I, I will yeah. tell you how deep this ignorance goes. Until 
And we look stupid. I'm going to tell you the truth. We look stupid as a body of Christ because mm. we are scared, they're scared to make a woman a bishop in relationship to the church and the marriage to Jesus. But they'll take that same woman and make her an overseer, which overseer is only a makeshift word for bishop. That's pretty much mm-hmm. what it is. When you go and study out five words or the four words that equal out bishop, elder, shepherd, pastor, overseer. They all mean the same thing. When you look up the scriptures, they all point to the same thing because the truth of the matter, and I'll probably get some calls from the College of Bishops tomorrow, because the truth of the matter, a bishop is not what they have made it today. A bishop is no more than a senior pastor in a church. That's pretty mm-hmm. much the bottom line. Mm-hmm. My name is Sheriff Smith. My uh, name is Mrs. Smith, uh, and I stand by this message. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, uh, can I ask this question? Go ahead. Uh, if, you really ask be, question? if you really want to be an apostle, uh, uh, a bishop is really uh, merely the equivalent of a deacon, if you really want to be technical. It's really oh, the yeah. equivalent of a deacon. So, so But here's one more question. Wait a minute, G. Johnson. We, I heard you that you want to ask a question. But before you do, Bishop Jefferson has one more question, and that is, why is it that Jesus didn't pick a woman apostle? Mm. Do, do yeah, we know that? Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Mm. Well, we start digging in that, do we actually know that he didn't? Because he had 12. Yeah. And he had 70. That's exactly well, right. I was no. about to say that. Now, wait, 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 wait. Let's 12? add one more number. Wait a minute. He had 12, but then he had 70. And then on the day of Pentecost, there were 120. Mm. So how were we working there? How many bishops or how many apostles might have been in that 120? We know about the original 12. And, 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 and we you know about the and if you want to talk what about the day of Pentecost, if you want to talk about the day of Pentecost, his mama, Mary Magdalene, and some other women were in the upper room, and, and he said he was going to make the twelve apostles, but it had to be made apostles after the Holy Ghost. So was everybody up there an apostle? So wait a minute, then. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. The 12 that Jesus picked were his particular choice. Even at Pentecost, the only that, the what remained was the 11 who were there during Pentecost. Not man one of them said that they were chosen as an apostle by Jesus Christ. It was after Pentecost Uh-oh. when the apostles came to the surface. The 12, he had 12 disciples. And see, this is where we, we, we the lose the. No, wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. I'm going somewhere with this Apostle Whitlow. He, Jesus, you find all through the Gospels, he talks about the 12 disciples, okay? He loses one disciple along the way who kills himself after he turns him in. Now, these men do not become apostles until after the death of Jesus Christ until after the resurrection and the resurrection of Jesus Christ because you find I'm trying to remember where it is uh, it's in Acts if I'm not mistaken where they chose what's his name Mathesis or Matthias I think his name was Matthias okay. You're okay he's chosen by the other 11 to fill the spot of Jewish, but, but, Judas Iscariot but now hold on let's look at this for a minute and two or three years later, now comes Apostle Paul, who was 
was not there and saw what the disciples who became apostles saw, but did have the encounter with Jesus. We got people arguing, Bible scholars arguing, that an apostle is supposed to be somebody who has had a close encounter, a physical encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And they legitimized Paul because of the the Damascus Road affair. Here is my thing. If apostles were formulated in the the age of grace or the dispensation of grace, is the dispensation of grace still open, yes or no? And I don't want to get too far away from the marriage thing and control because that's what we're talking about. We're opening and fishing with a whole new can of worms here. But all I'm, I'm going to make this statement and I'm going to back up off of it. If the a dispensation of grace is still open, that means for those scholars who say that the apostles were only the 12 plus Paul and there are no more apostles, uh, I'm sorry, ma'am, I'm sorry, sir, but since the grace age is still open, apostles still exist. Get over it and let's stop talking about it because you ain't going to change it. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And then I want to take that just a tad bit further. I will say to you, uh, Mr. Questionnaire, I want to say to you that there had to be women apostles called of God in that time because as we go along in scriptures, Paul says, remember these women who are my co-laborers. Uh-huh. They could not have been. They could have been evangelists. They could have been teachers, or else they're not co-laborers. When you are a co-something, that means we do the same thing. There you go. Well, again, and 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 there, there's so much that we have discovered and discussed. Really, that we really did pull away from where we were going tonight. Um, and I, I don't have a problem with it because somebody probably needs to hear it. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the question alluded to what did Jesus choose in his original choosing? Not one was a woman. Yes, there might have been some who followed him, but they were not his necessary choice. Now, what happened at Pentecost was because the scripture makes it clear that upon my spirit, I will pour out of my flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Even your handmaids shall prophesy. Young men shall see vision. Old men shall dream dreams. We are so much out of time tonight. I'm going to try again next week to deal with this control in marriage, and hopefully we'll be able to go a little bit further because there's more things that we have to look at. I so appreciate you, Apostle Vincent L. Smith. I so appreciate you, Overseer Elder Ernest E. Richard, Jr. I so appreciate you, Sister Glenda Johnson. I so appreciate you, Dr. Timmy Kim. I love you all. I appreciate you all. Let me say this to you all. Uh, We are going to be back next week, Saturday, at 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 Central. I do urge you to join us as we deal with some more Making Marriage Meaningful. On speaking on that wise, please hear me when I I say this, your marriage is meaningless until your mate becomes meaningful. Sweetheart, your husband tap you tonight, roll over. If you're single, cold shower. Kimmy Kim, I need you to hit that track. Go with God, he will go with you. Shalom, shalom.
Godzilla, my testimony. 